All right, David. Um, my name is Burke Files. I'm uh, coming to you from Arizona, but live in person here. And this is David Lesperance, uh, uh, Tony, coming from uh, coming live via Skype from Toronto. It's like a television show. I love this. You're you're on the big screen. I have to. I apologize in advance for the mistakes I'm about to make in my first Skype presentation. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> with the outline, uh, let's, uh, in the way we, we, we talked and went through this, really uh, David is going to kind of lean in real strong in the beginning, and then I'm going to come in a little bit, uh, a little bit later on. Let me start with uh, uh, multiple citizenships. Um, I believe in multiple citizenships uh, for some, uh, for myself. Uh, I have, I, I am not wealthy enough to purchase or invest uh, for uh, a second citizenship, but by heritage, I just applied last week for an Irish citizenship. Now, why, why for me is um, I travel to a lot of countries where they do not like Americans, and in fact, they actively hunt and shoot at us. So I thought a nice little neutral country up in the North Atlantic would be a good passport to have. Uh, David? Yes, and, and uh, the same thing, I've also got a, an EU uh, citizenship, and it's really looking at the acquisition of resident citizenships and domiciles in a portfolio manner, just as you would never have a single stock uh, or monitor that stock. Uh, stock may be great today, but who knows what's going to be you know, a, a positive or a negative for that stock years down the road. It also allows a diversification um, of allowing you and your family to be in, in multiple jurisdictions. If uh, you think back to you know the decision my ancestor made many generations ago to move from France to Canada, that had a profound effect not only on his life but of course on the the lives of uh, his subsequent generations. So it's really gone from being you know a James Bond like esoteric thing to really being mission critical. And, and we've got three kind of major cases, uh, which everybody knows about, where the, the importance of residence and citizenship really came to the forefront. And that was the Eduardo Sovereign case. He was the co-founder of uh, Facebook and is deciding to change his, or lose his US citizenship for tax purposes. Um, Bernard Arnault, the wealthiest man in France, the uh, founder of Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, and his recent moves in Belgium, and some recent discussion uh, with John Paulson, who is famous in, during the fiscal crisis for making the big bet. And uh, John Paulson, you know, there was a speculation as to whether he was going to move and change his residence from New York to Puerto Rico in this case. So it really has become. A, for many advisors, a, a very critical part of the advice that they give to their clients. Um, it, it, it is, and you'll see that I think his analysis, the portfolio analysis, is dead on. You're diversifying the laws and the citizenships like you would diversify the asset categories in which you, you hold those assets. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about the, the terminology of citizenship, passport, diplomatic, um, residence, et cetera. And when we look at these, it's critical that we, that we are, are using the same kind of terminology nomenclature. So what is a citizenship? A citizenship is, is a lifelong status given by a country affording all its rights. You will see when, as you delve into this area, terms like honorary citizenship. And, and the best phrase I've heard for honorary citizenship is it's a bit like being honorarily pregnant. It doesn't produce the desired result. <laughs> then there, and a, a citizenship is a status for life. A passport is the finite travel document of a citizen, depending on the country. It will be for five or 10 years. Uh, and some countries, for example, um, Panama, issues something that's called a passport for a non-citizen which is an oxymoron and which for international travel is about as useful as a Panama City bus pass. Then we have something called a diplomatic posting or diplomatic passport. And a diplomatic passport, like every passport, is a finite travel document. 
but it's given to an individual who has been given some type of diplomatic appointment by a government. It is not a, life, uh, a lifelong status. It can be taken away at any time. Uh, change of regime, uh, change of heart by the people. It also, if somebody wants to live in another country, if, for example, David Lesperance wanted to be the U.S. Council to Madagascar, not only would, or the Canadian Council in this case, to Madagascar, not only would the Canadians have to appoint me as a diplomat, but the Malagasy's would have to accept me as a diplomat. So it, diplomatic uh, passports uh, are not a very common thing. I, I think you, you might rest. I think you want to add to that also traveling on a diplomatic passport. Anytime you go from country A to country B, you just don't go. You have to apply for a visa. It, it is. It, 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 people would think that it, it eases travel, but it actually makes it much more complicated because, of course, it's now a diplomatic event when you're traveling to a foreign country. Um, the last part is residence. And that a residence can be annual, can be permanent. It can lead to citizenship, depending on the country and the naturalization, or it may never lead to citizenship. One, for example, could become resident in the United Arab Emirates, but it will never lead to a UAE citizenship. So those are the terms, citizenship, passport, diplomatic passport, and residence. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about why seek a citizen, second citizenship, but uh, there's a couple of things here. There's a, a, a reference to a handout at David's uh, website, a, a PDF at David's website, but also, um, what about the ability on, on global tax? Resident citizenship and domicile, if we use the three cases that I mentioned earlier, Saverin, Arnaud, and Paulson, are really individuals looking at, they, they were born uh, into a tax uh, residence, tax domicile, uh, or tax position, and they, in a world where the golden geese, as I, I refer to them, <laughs> have the ability to make or maintain their wealth in a variety of jurisdictions without in any way dropping the quality of their life or their personal or business, um, they are no longer kind of stuck with the, the country of their birth. And in the case of, for example, Eduardo Saverin, he was actually born in Brazil. He immigrated to the United States, famously became a, the best friend of one Mark Zuckerberg, funded Facebook, um, and then and took out U.S. citizenship through the process. And he decided, I don't want to be tied for the rest of my life for, to U.S. citizenship and decided to give up his U.S. citizenship. He already had Brazil in his portfolio. And he actually decided to change his residence to Singapore because maybe that was because they didn't have capital gains. Maybe that was because they, it was more easily positioned for his investments in, in Asia. Um, so the ability to affect a global tax plan, just simply to have the ability, some clients are ready to implement the plan, some are saying, I just want to have a backup plan. I have a backup plan. I have a backup for my computer. I have fire insurance for my house. I'm not ready to leave or change right now. I simply want the opportunity to do that. That's one of the things. The other is really looking at increased mobility, the ability to live and work in a variety of jurisdictions. In our modern world, um, we're, we're simply one terrorist act away from not being able to go into various jurisdictions. I am a Canadian. Uh, I have a Canadian passport. I also have a, a European passport. If there was some incident uh, where there were terrorists and all of a sudden Canadian citizens weren't easy, were, were, were viewed suspiciously, um, that may inhibit my ability to travel if I only have a Canadian passport. I experienced that a number of years ago when we had an a, a outbreak called SARS and I flew to Belize City, and anybody who's been to Belize City knows that it's not really a, 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 a hot spot. And I felt like I was in the Andromeda strain. I was pulled aside because I had a Canadian passport. I flew from Toronto. I had to go through a bunch of different health things. And so it's that ability for you and your family to be able to move really wherever you want. Another thing is looking at restrictions. For example, in the EU, you cannot acquire 
certain businesses unless you're an EU citizen. So there was recently a very wealthy Colombian gentleman who was in the airline business who wanted to buy into TAP, which is the Portuguese airline, and he couldn't do that as a Colombian, so he got an EU citizenship in order to make an investment. And also, as Burke mentioned, decreasing your profile in various countries. Um, I, I come from a family that has a lot of dual citizens, and when we were in the, I don't know if people still do this, but when you graduate from college, you do the grand tour of Europe. And uh, my own brother, who carries both a U.S. and a Canadian passport, traveled on a Canadian passport simply to avoid getting into discussions everywhere as to, you know, why did you, insert name of currently unpopular country, decide to do this as if, you know, every citizen runs the country and has, has input in the policy. So it's really for taxes, increasing mobility, to engage in certain business transactions, to decrease profile. And another important one is to have the right jurisdiction for litigation. The United States, for example, for a variety of reasons, has a, a, an overwhelming majority of the, of the world's civil litigation. But the most common litigation that most of our clients will be involved in will be matrimonial. It is not a black swan event. It occurs in 50% of the golden geese marriages, and it, we're not looking at a percentage of income or capital gain as we are in taxes, but actually half of half of assets. And so, if you you can have a wonderful uh, trusts and wonderful prenuptial and, and uh, arrangements, but if you're in the wrong jurisdiction, which will not uphold that, then all of that effort is for naught. And so really having clients understand that residence, domicile, and, and uh, citizenship are key things that they need to understand for tax planning, succession planning, you know, mobility, etc. One of the problems we were discussing in our, in our several uh, calls was what happens if you have multiple citizenships and you change your domicile and don't get the necessary planning. You were talking about that one particular divorce case where a couple moved from one place in Europe to the UK. Yeah, that was the, the Rodmaker case for, for this was a, uh, an heiress uh, to a, uh, a German fortune, married a Frenchman, they moved to the UK. While they were still in Germany, they entered into a uh, what was quite common in that jurisdiction, a, a prenuptial arrangement. Uh, they then moved to the UK. They became divorced uh, several years later. If they had been within the jurisdiction of the German courts or had comity or connection with that jurisdiction, then the property division uh, would have been a half, half an hour meeting in the lawyer's office. However, the UK does not take kindly, UK family courts do not take kindly to prenuptial arrangements and it ended up being a very long, run out, extraordinarily expensive, often appealed uh, process. So the, and, and one can get into, you know, is a prenuptial arrangement a, a good thing or a bad thing, but for my clients it's really looking at knowing you have the certainty so that you don't lose all your emotional capital with a, with a co-parent in going through a divorce and there's nothing you can't raise the children after because going through the divorce you can't talk to each other anymore. It's also very important for business people because if you think, do you want to be approaching a bank to seek monies, funding for a, an acquisition that you're going to be doing and they'll look at you and say, well you're going through a divorce, I, we have no idea what collateral you actually own can, can put up with this. So it, it, it very much takes over people's lives so prenuptial arrangements are really to add certainty and speed should the, the relationship fall apart, as opposed to an effort to try to, try to you know, screw one, one party out, out of uh, monies that they would otherwise get. And that's so being in the right jurisdiction all through the process is something that's critical for advisors to be aware of. Correct, and, and changing uh, domicile once you have a, a tax and an airship plan set up, if you begin to think about changing residency, the first thing you should consider, other than it may be a nice place to live, is how will this affect all the planning that's been taking place already. And, and that's quite a common thing. In Canada, we have a lot of 
what I referred to as hidden Americans, and you have people who, because they have U.S. citizenship, because they have a, a, an American parent uh, who have been completely tax compliant in Canada, have filed and paid everything in Canada, did not realize that they also had a U.S. tax obligation, uh, who had advisors who set up wonderful succession plans which took, it, took into account every Canadian law but did not acknowledge the American law. And when they, when they died, their executive discovered to their horror that, there was, that this plan not only didn't deal with U.S. tax but triggered a whole bunch of, of different things. And now those advisors are finding themselves in lawsuits for not having taken this key fact into account when they design the the, uh, the succession plan. And, um, There's a liability issue for advisors also. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, also, we talked about the children having a choice. Now, if you have an economic citizenship, um, does that follow, does your economic citizenship necessarily follow to the children, or is it just by, say, heritage? Well, there's a variety of ways of getting a citizenship. You can get it by heritage, uh, which is, I won't throw the Latin terms on you, but it is dealing with rights of blood. And many countries do do that. They say, even though the child may have been, if the child is born to a citizen of our country, even though they're not born in our territory, they, they either automatically are citizens or the, they have the, the parents have the ability to apply for citizenship for them. Um, there's also place of birth. This is if you happen to be born physically in, in a jurisdiction, if they have that, uh, uh, so a, um, right of soil, right, then you get citizenship. Depends on the, on the jurisdiction. There are some countries where you can be born, raised, spend your entire life there. Again, I mentioned the UAE where you're never entitled to citizenship. They solely give it by right of blood. Other countries give it by right of being married to a national. That is becoming less and less because in a very globalized world, um, jurisdictions are finding that that was being abused. There was uh, the, the small uh, Italian uh, uh, city-state of San Marino, which all of a sudden uh, elderly San Marino Men were marrying uh, uh, women from uh, uh, Russia and the Ukraine, and they were getting into they were getting San Marino EU citizenships. And the um, women in San Marino did not like this, and they ended up closing up that particular clause. Um, there's also by naturalization. This is when the client acquires the correct residence. Remember, we talked about is it a residence leading citizenship? Residents and then they fulfill the naturalization requirements, which vary for, with every country, which may require some physical presence, may require tax, may require certain certain connections to that jurisdiction. Another way of acquiring a citizenship is by religion. Uh, most famously in Israel is the law of return. And the final is by government grant. Almost every country in the world grants the power to somebody that may be a president, a prime minister, it may be a cabinet, somebody under their constitution or citizenship law has the power to grant citizenship. Now that may be for humanitarian reasons, for example the Dalai Lama has gotten citizenship in a variety of countries, it may be artists, it may be athletes who may be, you know, will bring a gold medal, or it can be for a charitable or economic contribution. So it's becoming, it's one of the things that I do a fair amount of, which is which I call bespoke kind of citizenships, which is really looking at um, negotiating with governments for to grant citizenships on kind of one one off special circumstance cases, like you know, Gerard uh, Depardieu and his uh, famous Russian citizenship. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and, uh, and and that's a that's a great example. Um, now. And, they, and, and in that case, it was the, the, the president, which is Monsieur Putin, and uh, he decided that he was going to grant uh, Depardieu um, citizenship. Uh, when people talk about use the term economic citizenship, really what that is is an accelerated naturalization. So some countries have put into their statutes 
that they will, if, if individuals fulfill certain criteria, that may be an investment, that may be a donation, that may be a charitable donation, depends on the country, then they will waive the normal naturalization requirements and grant citizenship. So economic citizenship is really an accelerated naturalization. Um, there are different types of, of, of permits and residencies and passports, and uh, we got into this quite a bit, and uh, I got an earful this morning from uh, a few former uh, U.S. Uh, federal officials to add a fifth category, uh, we have legislative, uh, vague opening uh, for convention on how to proceed, nothing codified in statutes, fast track, and then the fifth category that they wanted me to add is counterfeit documents. <coughs> so, <coughs> right now, a major source of revenue for St. Kitts uh, and Dom uh, St. Kitts Nevis and Dominica is a legislative authorization for uh, for their passports, their economic citizenship. There's a there's an investment there. Go ahead, David. I'm sorry. I'm no. Uh, so in, in, in both Dominica and St. Kitts, what they did is took the, the power of a government grant and and moved it from an ad hoc basis into kind of a statutory basis. And said if you meet these particular requirements. Um, it, that, that may be an investment in a particular approved business or, or approved real estate or a government donation. St. Kitts has something called the Sugar Industry Diversification Fund. Um, but as I like to say, if you're going to give a government money and they're not giving it back and they're not giving you interest, you can call it zippity doo -dah. It's a government fee. <laughs> so it's, a, it's just a straight up government fee. Now, and they are, they are accelerated, the naturalization requirements in, in both of those countries, I think, are five or seven years each. Those are waived, and the client is actually granted citizenship and the travel document of a citizen, a passport, which all ECC passports are 10-year documents. Um, the second is, is those that have a vague opening for some type of citizenship uh, by a kind of a convention on how to proceed, but not necessarily in statutes. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that's, and we really, that's, we, we developed the uh, uh, sheet that people uh, should have in front of them called Evaluating Citizenship and Residence Programs. And this is really how, as an advisor, you go through the, the, the process of separating the wheat from the chaff. So, you know, Burke, you and I, we Googled second passports and second residences. You, you literally get over a million hits. And Burke is going to take us through, you know, how you evaluate uh, some of those things. But really, when you're looking at the, your clients and your passport portfolio, you really need to understand what is it that I'm trying to acquire, um, and then what is being offered. And, and that's where we go through this decision tree, and part of what you're trying to understand, and the point you're referring to, is legal basis. So. Um, is there a legal basis for doing for doing this? And are you dealing with the body, individual, department, which has been granted under that jurisdiction the authority to issue that document? Yeah. One of the big dangers in going through this process and making sure you're doing it right is that you don't want to have one of your clients traveling on a document that was either improperly issued or was issued as a result of, of some type of, of payment or fraud, um, because your, your client will not only lose all of the costs of doing this, but will probably find themselves not only stopped at borders, and, and certainly the, the exchange of information we have in our, in our, in our world today, particularly with airlines uh, or flights, uh, that's, a, that's not really a danger so much as a certainty, but also, uh, foreign corrupt officials uh, issues and that's something you don't want your clients entangled with and that's something as an advisor that you want to make sure that that you deal with so it's an important this is a very important thing mission critical as a couple of family offices told me but you need to do it right and you need to go through the process properly 
you know, we were looking at uh, some of the different sites, and uh, you know, we've got we've got we'll call them the white documents. Those that are codified in statute have a regular process of going through it. They let you know what you need to do. That there's full disclosure on your behalf, and they really do conduct a due diligence background on the people that they grant citizenship to. That is where you want to stay. You want to stay up at that level. There's kind of a, the gray market, and I'll call those, it's the, the vague opening, the nothing codified in statutes. Well, there's probably some type of emolument paid along the way. That's much nicer than saying bribe or expediting fee, because that's not actually in the statutes for foreign corrupt practices. They, they, they missed that descriptor. But you, you've, got that, you've got that problem. Are, are you paying a fee to someone to get you a document that you otherwise would or would not be entitled to? So you, you have a document, someone discovers that someone is issuing these on the side. You've, you've got uh, in Paraguay, there's a, a company that's offering you to come down there for $35,000 fly in, do the blood test, do the background check, and, and you're out of there within a week being approved and you'll get your passport and citizenship, not residency, citizenship, within 30 days. Tell me there isn't an expedite fee somewhere in that process. I can't find it in the Paraguayan statutes. I sent a copy of this link to a, a, a commercial attaché for Paraguay in uh, Los Angeles. He goes, I am, <clears throat> he called back, he was very nice, he goes, I am totally and completely unfamiliar with how something like this would work. Great diplomatic speech. <clears throat> um, yeah, but fast track always scares the snot out of me. And, and now you've got things like counterfeit documents. Uh, for a period of time when Noriega was in charge of Panama, the military had gone in and counterfeited the, uh, the passports and was issuing counterfeit Panamanian passports for $30,000. They worked because then they would then enter them into the Panamanian registry. When this was discovered, what happened to all those passports? Mm -hmm. Gone. They were gone. So you had people that had renounced their citizenship in another country and now had no citizenship in Panama, what do you do, where do you go? I mean, that's a place I, I don't want to end up and I wouldn't want to see a client end up. Um, if you're an advisor and you're recommending these services, you can be held a party to the crime because you're the one recommending the process. Um, I'm a chicken. I've seen the inside of jails going to visit and, and uh, some clients that weren't listening it's a very scary place. I don't want to go there on, on, on a long-term visit. An hour, mm, maybe not. Um, prepare for a reaction. If you're seeking the, uh, the second citizenship or your clients are seeking the second citizenship, there's a very common thread of reactions. Only the rich people have multiple citizenships. Well, that's not true. Uh, there's a, a whole host of people, both in Mexico and Canada, that have U.S. residency because they were born here. Now, maybe someone didn't tell them about the Foreign Bank Account Reporting Act or that they still have to file tax returns. That's led to a few red-faced moments to some uh, Mexican industrialists that come up here and go, I had to file a what? Um, only criminals need multiple citizenships. Uh, no, no, us regular people want multiple citizenships. Um, consider what uh, Israel did when Israel went in many years ago to occupy parts of the West Bank and Gaza. Those people who had a passport uh, of, of, of an EU country or, or a U.S., something other than Israel or, or an Arab nation, they were allowed out before they did the invasion. That would be, that'd be a nice get-out-of-hazard uh, document to have. Um, and then the last, which uh, and Americans will face a great deal. Now, mind you, what percent of Americans have passports, David? Oh, I, I, I don't know if it's increased because of the Foreign Travel Initiative, but it was less than 15%. Yeah, it's right at 15%. And now you have a... statistic in Congress, only 30% of senators and, and representatives had a passport. And they should stay home. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I'll get myself in trouble. That's, Demi that's your tax dollars that work. Yeah, Democrats and Republicans. I can't figure out the difference between the two anymore. Um, you're not a patriot. You have another sit. You're not a patriot. Like, okay. <laughs> These are reactions that people are going to face either yourself or your clients are going to face. And they just need to be ready for the reactions. I am a patriot, but I'm looking to diversify 
my travel. I myself, I love the United States, but I travel some places where a United States passport is not a, a fun thing to have. It would be not much nicer to have a little Irish passport uh, with a name like Burke. I might be able to get away with it. Uh, because they, uh, they do not like Americans, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa where I've been traveling. Uh, due diligence. This is my pet subject. I've written two books on due diligence. One actually won two book awards. It just, I got the first one. I laughed like heck. I got the second one. I just fell over. It was, it was hysterical. I have no idea how that happened. Um, due diligence is nothing more and nothing less than doing all of your homework on representations expressed and implied on a matter or topic before making a choice. You need to do your homework on the nation you choose and the process under which you're going to get a passport or seek residency and a passport. You need to do your homework. Do not choose a nation that does not do their homework on you. Um, right now, uh, there are many nationals, uh, Iranian and Syrian and North Koreans, that are seeking economic citizenship in many different countries. How do I know this? Well, I do the due diligence on applicants for many different countries, and I've seen them come across my desk. These are scary people. These are not, these are not ice cream vendors. And they're seeking citizenship anywhere they can to get out from underneath the sanctions and where they're at. I get it. I understand it. But do you want to have your clients going to a country that's granting citizenships to these specially designated nationals? I think that would be unwise. It would be one of those red-faced moments. Do you just, you just Burke, I'm going to give you a, a, an example. Sure. Uh, um, Montenegro, which is not an EU country, but an EU candidate country, um, was looking in, in uh, designing an economic citizenship program. I don't act on behalf of countries, I act on behalf of clients, but I, if you want to design your program to be attractive to my clients, that's great. In the process of, of setting things up, and I view having a security check, if there isn't a security check done, your client should not be interested in that citizenship. Because it's not only checking them out, but they would. it's critical that they know who in the front of the line and behind the line um, is also joining that club because they don't want to be arriving at an airport reading the newspaper that five Colombian drug lords were just arrested with the document they're about to present. And what happened in Montenegro is they, they granted citizenship, which is their sovereign right, to uh, the former Prime Minister of Thailand, Mr. Thaksin, who was on the Interpol wanted list. And I went back to the Montenegro government and said, absolutely, you're right to do that. And it's also absolutely my responsibility to advise my clients not to acquire the same passport that somebody who's wanted on an Interpol is traveling on. Due diligence is, is essential. Yeah. When you have the documents in front of you for the given nation, do follow the instructions. It helps with the process. Now, it may seem obvious that, I, that you should follow the instructions, but I think there's about a fifth of the applications I look at that they've not followed the instructions. These are wealthy, very much A personality people, and they figure that based upon their, their, their history and their money, this is a done deal. No, it's not, because they will reject all of the nations I, I do the work for will reject the application if it is not completed in full. And a silly thing, do speak to your references. Um, I, uh, I got a, a complaint filed against me with the SEC because I was an unauthorized phone solicitor. I kept calling one person asking them if there would be a reference for this person. They said, what are you trying to sell me? I said, listen to the question. Well, they filed a complaint against me as an authorized solicitor, and I was supposed to put their phone number on a do not call list. I'm going to put that on the call every hour list. So do speak to your references so they expect a call from someone doing the due diligence. Because what goes in on the report? Called seven times. They refused to speak to me and reported me to the FCC for unsolicited, uh, uh, unsolicited calls. Lovely. <clears throat> um, select a team. It's not just a lawyer. It's not just a due diligence person. Uh, it's a tax person. Talk to your family members. Get, get the stakeholders that are involved in your life and your compliance involved. The 
there's a, a checklist of things to consider. Uh, David has been kind enough to send that, and it's attached. Um, and just a point that, uh, to continue on on the, on the one sure. we were just making, Berg, is uh, one of my clients used the analogy um, that, you know, trying to do, for example, a, a whole tax plan involving changing residences and ship and domicile is a bit like writing a symphony. Now, I just play first violin. I get and get rid of documents in order to affect plans. But it's you, having somebody who is familiar with the issues, family law, tax, mobility, etc., who is going to be working with, because clients who do this tend to already have a team. They have a team of trusted advisors who understand their situation, what their risk tolerances are, what their preferences are. And you really need to have an advisor dealing with what I call passport portfolio matters who can really work with the rest of the team. Because if they get it in isolation, if the client goes off and gets a citizenship and their advisors go, well, didn't you realize that this had some type of impact? <laughs> um, and the client kind of thinks, you know, they're, they, they play armchair offshore and decide to do this and they don't see how it fits into the biggest, bigger picture. Not um, at, at the least, it'll be a waste of money, but it could actually draw them into, uh, uh, you know, major costs, whether that's taxation, military service, that may be being in the wrong jurisdiction like the rad makers, etc. Critical that you're, that this be seen as a, as a holistic effort. And it is a very good point, a, a holistic effort, all the stakeholders, all the professionals. Um, things to avoid. <clears throat> Vogue locations, such as diplomatic passports from a leading African country. I don't want to say Mozambique, but it might be Mozambique. <laughs> no due diligence on you? We have a fast track to get you what you need. No list of any of the principles of the team are on the website of the group promoting it. Any site actually offering diplomatic passports or credentials for any reason. These are sites, these are, these are, these are red flags to me. And yeah. I, I, I'm one to say, all right, you've got an opportunity for a diplomatic passport or, or expedite, that's great. Prove to me it's going to work. And time and time again, when you start asking the difficult questions, either by email or phone, you get what I call the crayfish. They start walking sideways on you. How is this going to work? Where is it going to go? How am I going to get this? Where, what is the ultimate cost? Well, you, you have to come here and visit and bring some cash. Oh, thank you. No, I don't want to do that. These are all things that clients of mine have been courted with and steer them over to other professionals that actually will handle, handle it correctly. Um, the industry. Uh, I think that economic citizenship or, or selling or renting citizenship is going to go up. It, it's not going to decline. I believe that the residency requirements and naturalization requirements in the developing nations are going to shorten, not lengthen. Uh, I believe that more uh, citizens of, as at least I know of Italy and Ireland, and there's a few other European nations, are going to be looking to their heritage to get a, a, a passport based upon heritage. I don't see it shrinking. I see it increasing. Even the United States, through its EB-5 visa program, is looking to increase the number of EB-5s that are offered. And an EB-5 is an investment of a half a million dollars in a rural or depressed area, or typically a million dollars, and you generate 10 jobs. Once you go through that process, you get a green card, and it's a fairly short track. Now, we, we talked a little bit about this and the EB-5 people coming out of China. What's interesting for the Chinese getting their EB-5 is they're not looking to move to the United States. You know what they want? They want their children to be educated in the United States, and they want their, they want their little uh, rat hole of cash, in case something goes bad, to be in the United States. They want the United States as a trusted jurisdiction for safety and education. 
I find that a very interesting reason. And they, after they've got the ED5, the children are then, after they graduate, are going back to China. Turtles, they're called. Turtles. <laughs> uh, and, and that reminds me, particularly, I had a client from Shanghai who uh, told me a great story. He said, look, the Shanghainese have been the business people of China for millennia. We saw the emperor, we saw the Taiping, we saw the Boxer Rebellion, we saw the nationalists, we saw the communists, we not saw the new communists. No matter who is in power, it was always smart to have a fast junk in the harbor with a second set of papers and some gold bars. And the world as we've seen it, the change is happening and it is happening at accelerated rates. And so having a backup plan should a change which is going to be nasty for your particular client um, it is something that again just as having fire insurance in your house you don't get it because you think there's a good chance of a fire you get it because if the event happens it's catastrophic yeah that's the uh, the, the the cause the car the, uh, the event chance is small but the impact is massive yes it's absolutely massive um, what other trends do you see happening, David? Um, I certainly do see there, whether you think it's fair or not, don't won't we'll get into that debate, progressive tax systems um, are extremely reliant on a very small number of taxpayers for a large percentage of, of their actual taxes collected. Typically, the top 1% of taxpayers contribute just over a third of the total tax revenue, what I call the golden geese. And contrary to Occupy Wall Street kind of rhetoric, they're not homogenous with regards to their personalities, their, their attitudes towards tax, philanthropy, etc. I like saying both Michael Moore and the head of Goldman Sachs are both in the top 1%. In fact, they're probably in the 0.1%. But if you look at this group, which I'll call the Golden Geese, the one thing that they do have in common is as a result of globalization and, and Freeman's flattening effects, they have the, the ability to move. They have the ability to make and maintain their lifestyle and their wealth in a variety of jurisdictions. And there is an enormous competition for, the, for, those, for those people. And you will see, continue to see governments try to attract them. Because you just need a small number of these golden geese to leave to have a huge negative effect on your, on your tax collections. Likewise, you only need a few of them to come to have a huge positive effect. So you are already seeing, for example, if you look at the Bernard Arnauds, the John Paulsons, the Eduardo Saverns, places like Singapore, Canada, the United Kingdom with a resident non dom Switzerland, Belgium, Australia, New Zealand. In fact, the list of countries which are not designing programs to attract foreign golden geese is quite small. Most countries do it. The U.S. is trying to do it with China, just as Burke said. So it's really understanding that there is, there is going to continue to be a massive move of these people. And it's, you know, it, it's just inevitable that the, the golden geese are going to want to have a backup system. That's most of our presentation. I want to let you know that we are here for you. Uh, the participants, and uh, while, while David may be remote, all of his contact information is on the sheet. I'm here for the next two days. Uh, again, here you corner me or call David. Um, do you have some questions from the audience? All at once. Please don't jump up all at once. Terry? You know, when you talk about paying for these passports, these <coughs> corrupt deals with local The question is, if you're involved in buying passports as a U.S. citizen, doesn't that violate the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act? Yeah. Next. To, you know. well, sorry, hold on. If you are helping a client acquire a citizenship legally, in which you're not engaging in any corruption of foreign officials, but rather going through the legal process of, grabbing, of getting that citizenship, you are not in any violation of, of foreign corrupt officials. If you are either directly or through an agent acquiring a citizenship where there is a, a payoff or corruption or undue influence being used, 
uh, then yes, you are in violation of the Foreign Corrupt Officials legislation. Yeah, it, it's unwise to get the new citizenship through a felony. It may jeopardize it. One of the other things Bert, that, I, that I, I have seen, and I, I think you have seen also, is clients who get one of these citizenships and who actually get a travel document and you know from a from a corrupt passport official who takes a real passport from that country but does not properly issue it you know they they, they do it on a bribe now the person find and then the, the the agent who they paid a lot of money to says oh by the way that was acquired by a payoff so now they're, they are alerting the person to the fact that they were a party and they may have foreign corrupt officials legislation. And now they want the second fee, which is the blackmail fee saying, and I'm going to disclose this, that you have a passport which was, which was acquired through fraud unless you continue to pay me a nice monthly stipend of this and this. And the client finds himself in the situation where they're being blackmailed quite effectively. And of course, they're not traveling on the document. They're horrified of the thing. They probably you know, burn it in the fireplace. But they've still got this problem. And so that's, again, in going through, and, and we do have the checklist. And I actually did a video presentation, which is on my website, which kind of explains the importance of each one of these, these, uh, these sections. And there's another video which kind of explains, and for you to explain to your clients, why a, a passport portfolio is important. But no, this is, this is an important area that you want to have to do properly. Yeah, and going back to something that uh, I did uh, last week, contacting uh, the Paraguay uh, Commercial Embassy in Los Angeles, I, I contacted them because that was the closest to me in Arizona. The time zone was right. They were willing to talk. Uh, but if you have a question, pick up the phone and call the embassy. Is this, send them a link, is this right? Ask the country representative. If the country representative said, oh yeah, that's something we started six months ago. We're trying to get more people to come in here and invest in, in Zebland. Uh, come on down. It's $25,000 and you'll get a Zebland passport. Great. Now it's been confirmed. That's fine. If, if like the, the gentleman from Paraguay said, um, I am wholly, totally and completely unfamiliar with this, I, I would take him at his word also and uh, maybe move to a different type of citizenship or a different type of process. Pick up the phone, do the email, ask the questions. If you're afraid of asking the questions, drop me an email, I'll ask the questions. Um, I'm famous for calling anyone. There was a, a, a matter uh, before me a couple of months ago, no, actually about four weeks ago, of a gentleman who was going around uh, Europe saying he was a friend of Henry Kravitz, of Coleman Kravitz and Roberts. Big leverage buyout firm in New York, private equity. So I called him up. Is this guy Lawrence? Uh, do you know him? No. Why are you calling me? <laughs> I said, he's trading on your reputation. It's quiet. He laughs. He goes, I've never heard of him. I have no idea who he is. I said, okay, thank you. It's quiet. He goes, do you just call up anyone? I said, yes, actually, I have. How many times have we heard uh, people trading on the reputation of, do you remember the, uh, uh, the, uh, the entrepreneur Tito, who went up with the Russian space station, someone was trading on his name. I called and spoke to him. Very nice, very happy to make sure no one was getting defrauded by leveraging his name. The same is true with the people in the embassies. They don't want to have any problems happen for their country, so call them up if you have a question. David? No, I think if there's not any more questions from the uh uh, I think the materials uh, speak for themselves. If you didn't catch everything, uh, I think you, or Burke and I are available by email. I have a lot of material on my website, including videos, and, uh, which, um, and so the takeaways that we want to leave for, for you as advisors are that this is, a, this is a very important area and something you need to deal with with regards to your clients. However, when you do deal with it, you need to deal with it right. Uh, because the, the danger of doing nothing is significant, but the danger of doing something poorly is even worse. It, quite correct, quite correct. Any other questions? Oh, sir? 
If you're a US person and you have no heritage links to another country, where would you pick? If you're a US citizen and have no heritage links to any other country, where would you pick? Well, I would ask the question, what are you trying to achieve? What is, it, what is your budget? If you're somebody who is a, a, a very wealthy hedge fund manager who wants to expatriate from the United States, um, I would say, well, you can certainly go, you know, uh, for an economic citizenship. It depends on what your timing is. You could go for an economic citizenship in Dominica and say, kids, your problem is mechanically that if you, you can expatriate, because you're a citizen of another country, you can give up your U.S. citizenship. The problem is there will be a gap period between the date you expatriate and the date that you get a certificate of loss of nationality, which is the first date that you could apply for and get a, a visa to go back and visit. And so if you're going to be saying to your hedge fund manager, you can expatriate, depending on the period of time, it may be six or nine months before you can come back into the United States. Well, no, I have a bunch of meetings that I have to go to in the United States. So then we would say, well, then you want to have a citizenship which nationals of that country don't need a visa to go to the United States. For example, Canada, Bermuda, and there's a whole list of what are called the U.S. visa waiver programs. And so for that client, that would be the right one. For the client who has a long period of time, who can say, well, you know, I don't have the budget, but this is a long-term plan. They may decide to move to a country like Canada or Australia or New Zealand or, or the UK and get citizenship in the normal course. It takes a lot longer, but is infinitely cheaper. Um, it, so what is the right citizenship depends on what the client's goals are, what their timing is, what their budget is, and what benefit that they will get from expatriate. I've had clients who said, well, David, this is your, the, and I quote project fees, for example, so that clients can say, if I spend this much, I will save this much. Sorry, you couldn't see my hands. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it really, what is, the, what is the right citizenship depends on the client situation. It's a good question. I like that. Others? When you have an exit tax in the U.S. in a, in a period where you still are subject to U.S. taxes. Do you not have an... Factor that into the analysis. To repeat the question, do you not have an exit tax that for a period of time you're responsible not only to, to pay the exit tax but also file tax returns? You're, you're, so, first off, there is no such thing as an exit tax. It is a capital gains event. So it is a deemed disposition. The particular change that you're talking about, which was used to be the 10-year rule, was, was changed. And, and it became a deemed disposition, a mark to market. So you now, so let's look at the case of Eduardo Sabrin, for example. <clears throat> he bought Facebook shares for $19,000. The social network is correct. And he was given, or he had, at the time of his expatriation, shares that were worth over a billion dollars. The U.S. said the day, Mr. Saverin, you gave up your citizenship and, and reverted to simply being a Brazilian, that day you were deemed to have sold at fair market value pursuant to our rules the total amount of money that was that was owed. So his cost basis was 19000 his fair market value was, was a billion, he paid the capital gains on that difference. From that moment forward, he paid no U.S. income cap gain gift or estate tax. He would only, if he happened to have U.S. situs, be like any foreigner that you had, had U.S. situs or U.S. source income. And so when what happened was Charles Schumer, when the time of the, of the IPO was happening, he stood up and said, Eduardo Saverin has evaded a whole millions of dollars of tax. That was, of course, based upon the IPO price of Facebook which, as we all found out a few weeks later, wasn't quite worth as much as they thought. So he was saying he's evaded, you know, $60 million worth of tax, which was like a napkin number. Uh, didn't acknowledge that he paid hundreds of millions of dollars in tax. Um, and, you know, that, that was the outcome. And he proposed, which was shot down for lack of constitutionality, that was a great grandstanding, but it never went, that, that was the expatriate act. 
So the tax ramifications of giving up your U.S. citizenship currently are that you are deemed to have disposed of your assets at the fair market value as of the date of the expatriation. You, if, and that is, you have to go to a form called a, a um, 8854. And that 8854 asks you two questions. Do you have a certain average income tax paid over the last five years? And do you have certain assets, which is equal to the fair, family unified credit, which is your estate tax exemption? If so, then you are deemed to have sold, you are deemed to have expatriated for tax purposes, you are deemed to have sold an FMV as of that date. And people say, well, okay, but look, capital gains tax is something that you're going to pay anyway, with borrowing costs being basically zero right now, taking the liquidity. I have a lot of clients who are choosing to expatriate because they want to enjoy the capital gain, income tax, gift and estate tax free from this point forward. Eduardo Saverin is 30 years old. He's got 46 more years of not paying U.S. tax. When net is equal to gross, you can do fairly well for yourself. That's very well said. Yeah, and capital gains is what, still 15? Well, the capital gains tax will be whatever it is, depending yeah. on whether it's short term or long term, depending on, you know, part of your capital gain may be on your principal residence, you've got a certain exemption for that. There. So it's your normal capital gains. It's, it's as if you are dying to the U.S. tax system. The same capital gain you would pay upon death. I believe that's the whole purpose, dying to the U.S. tax system. Please, you have a question? Do you have any more particulars on the EB-5 program? Is it just for the Chinese or is it for anybody? Do you have any more particulars on the EB-5 program? Is it just for the Chinese or for anybody? I can jump well, in. The EB-5 program is, is open to everybody. It is not subject to the country quota. The U.S. has a, a particular uh, anomaly, which is they say we, we're going to grant a certain number of resident alien or green card statuses to each country, but the EB program is not. Now, there is only you know, a couple of thousand, they're, they're looking to extend that to 10,000 uh, in a year, and they've never fully subscribed it yet, um, but they are certainly pushing that uh, more and more. So if your clients from anywhere can get EB-5. The question that I would ask, if I had a client, I would say, what, what is it that you want to do in the United States? If the answer is, I want to be able to put my kids in school there, I want to be able to work there, I, I love New York, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, wherever it is. I say, fine, we can do that. But the if EB-5 will lead to a resident alien status, which is automatically makes you a U.S. person for tax purposes. We can get you a non-immigrant visa under a variety of different categories, which allows you to do what you want to do in the United States, but does not automatically make you a, a tax resident. So there are lots, so the real question is sit, sitting back and establishing with the client, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And then what is the right combination of resident citizenship and domiciles, which is going to help you achieve those goals at the lowest possible price, at the fastest possible thing with the, with the least possible entanglements. I'm getting the lovely wave that we're gonna have to terminate. We've run over just by a few moments. Um, corner me or, or David, and thank you very much, David. I hope all goes thank better you. there. Thank you for coming. Yay, Skype works. <laughs>